الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين So inshallah, uh, as you all know, we've gathered here today to have some sort of a presentation on janazah. And janazah in Islam refers to that concept of tajhiz, taghseel, takfin, salah, and dafn. So basically getting the deceased ready, and it starts actually prior to that as we'll understand, but the janazah components are getting the deceased person ready, washing them, shrouding them, then praying upon them, then burying them. So inshallah today we'll be learning some theoretical aspects and inshallah in the next month's program we'll have a practical demonstration of how to wash a deceased person. And inshallah we want many volunteers from here to you know, come forth and say that we will and we are able after this presentation to volunteer to assist individuals and families whose beloveds and whose near ones have passed away and now they are in need of this moment of washing and shrouding but at times there's nobody available. Let me give you an example just today, subhanAllah. I wanted to try to do the practical demonstration of washing and shrouding the dead body or the deceased today. And I call the people who are in charge for taking care of the janazas. Brother Abdul Karim Mawid and Abu Nidal and some of the other people. And guess what? They're all out of town. They're all out of town. But while they are in town, you know, they are the ones taking care of this shrouding and washing. So la qaddar Allah, la samah Allah, Allah forbid. What happens if these people are not there anymore? If they've moved on to different communities or like today, they're out of town and we have a bad event. For example, an urgent need that a janazah, washing, shrouding, salah needs to be fulfilled. Who is going to take care of that? So if you feel comfortable just with a raise of hands, how many people here have washed the body, a body before in their life? So not many hands, right? Now this in, a, this in itself, you know, shows us that these fard aspects, fard kifaya aspects, obligatory at a sufficing level need to be fulfilled. And those who've probably washed bodies, they might have done it at occasion. Not something perpetually, not something regularly. So that is why, inshallah, let's start our journey from the moment where a natural death takes place. Why do I say natural death? Because many a times, unnatural death does occur. And ask those people who've dealt with unnatural deaths. A few Ramadans ago, I was invited to Moline, Illinois, as a guest speaker and you know, a taraweeh reciter. And just prior to my coming, there was a very bad motorbike accident. And I cannot say some of the details of that accident because there are children around here. And Sheikh Saad, Hafizahullah, the one who visited our community, who used to be in Moulin, Sheikh Saad dealt with that funeral. And you know the details that he described to me, only Allah have mercy upon us. So sometimes we see such events which are not naturally seen, yet we still need to be there to accommodate and be there to take charge and be ready to uh, facilitate for this dying person, facilitate for this person who has passed on uh, to be washed and shrouded adequately according to their situation. And inshallah, we'll explain those aspects when we have practical demonstrations. I'll have a few brothers uh, you know, come and help me. But until then, get these th theoretical points in mind and make sure that you are there for the next session, inshallah, so you know how to go about these matters practically. Brother Imani, just some water, inshallah. Okay. So now the person is dying. There are many words for this dying person. 
You call them in the Arabic language many a times, Qaribul Maut, somebody who is nearing death. Or Al Muhtadar, somebody who death is now, you know, present by. Come from Hadir, you know, Hadir means to be present. So death is now presenting itself to this person. How do you deal with this individual? Prior to this, you, you, you yourself need to have, you know, this yaqeen and this conviction that death will come to one and all. And this is something that we have to naturally expect. My brothers and sisters, I lie to you not. I have been at times in front of people who took three, four hours to battle their soul before their soul left their body. You know, as an imam, I've seen ajaib and gharaib. And many a times it's been six hours where this person is battling that soul to leave their body. So that is why, my beloved brothers and sisters, it's a very tough time for the person that's passing away and tough for the people around that person to see that glimpse. You need to be mentally ready. And in order for you to be mentally ready as a Muslim, you need to know al mawtu haqq, that death is real. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي بُرُوجِ مُشَيَّدَةِ Even if you are in a sanctified, fully covered fort, death will reach you. So as a Muslim, before you even think about washing somebody, or praying upon somebody, or shrouding somebody, you yourself need to know that this death is haqq, and it will reach me just as it's reached this person who's already passed away or who's suffering with this death. So let's start our journey, inshallah, after we've mentally readied ourselves. Number one, you embrace death. This is a visitor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's taking you now to meet your maker. And inshallah, you lived a good life. And hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now pleased with you and you're being welcomed with honor. That is something we need to rectify as well if we're not living good lives. So while this person is passing away, you comfort that dying person that is in your midst. The biggest means of comfort for the believer is the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ The believers are those Allah mentions many sifat. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ When the verses of the Qur'an, when the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited upon the believer, it increases them in faith. And increasing in faith is amounting to increasing in hope. And increasing in hope, even though you may be in a distressful situation, will amount to giving you some sort of a comfort. And hence what happens? وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And hence these people, they have a sense of extra reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So recite Qur'an around the dying person so long as this does not cause discomfort. Ibn Majah rahimahullah has an entire chapter in his sunan where he brings uh, narration after narration about reciting surahs such as Yasin upon somebody who is qareebul maut, somebody who is about to die. And others, other narrations, they mention that post-death you should recite Yasin as well. <clears throat> There's a weak narration, which as Imam Nawawi rahimahullah makes mention, could be used for fala'il and virtues. Inna uh, likulli shay'in qalbun wa qalbul qur'ani yasin. That everything has a heart, and the heart of the Qur'an is Yasin. Iqra'u yasina. عَلَىٰ مَوْتَاكُمْ Recite Yaseen upon your dead people. But, so long as it does not cause them discomfort. MashaAllah, some of these, once again, I call them ultra-religious, but they have much to learn. These ultra-religious people who don't know their deen, they continue in loud voices, reciting Qur'an or putting the recitation of Qari Abdul Basit or Mahir al-Mayaqli, and the dead, you know, person who's Qareeb al-Mawt is screaming, you know, screaming. Turn this off. And وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. We've seen situations at times where they say words of kufr as well in respect to the book of Allah. 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why you need to have this fiqh and this understanding of what to do and when to do that what. So in reference to reciting the Qur'an, so long as this does, recitation does not cause discomfort, you recite the Qur'an or you have some Qur'an on. But once you see the Qaribul Maut or the Muhtada, somebody who now death is visiting them to take them away, becoming agitated, you can even turn the Qur'an off and stop that recitation. Yes, it's the book of Allah. You know that, I know that. But there's a time and a place and a context. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Tabarak Wa Ta'ala told him in bold terms, أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ Are you going to force people until they're believers? أَنُلْزِمُكُمُوهَا وَأَنْتُمْ لَهَا كَارِهُونَ Are we going to force something good upon you when you dislike it? So make sure disliking and ta'a are not, are not one and all happening at the same place. The obedience of Allah and disliking, right? And once the person is comfortable, you can try to recite the Qur'an again and, uh, you know, see how this individual is doing. Now when you ha have yaqeen, right? When you have, uh, sorry, when you're seeing that person once again suffering, you encourage through hope. Look at this practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Sometimes it's not that time, that, you know, that person's time, but they're feeling as if they're dying. And that encouragement really just turns the, the pages. As the Prophet Sallallahu did to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu Allah, when the Prophet Sallallahu visited him at the occasion of Fathu Mecca. The Muslims have now conquered Mecca. And Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu falls very ill. As if he's on his deathbed. And what does the Prophet ﷺ do? He comes in happily and he gives him hope. You know, by literally chuckling and saying, you're going to live. Even if you possibly know things are as bad as they could be. Be that glimmer of hope. Don't stand there and say, oh, the same thing happened to my uncle and he died the, la you know, the next minute. Be that glimmer of hope. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu an, he lived years after that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him to be part of those sahaba radiallahu anhum who conquered Qadziyah under the rule of uh, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu arda. He outlived Abu Bakr, he outlived the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He outlived Abu Bakr and he outlived Umar's reign as well. He outlived Uthman's reign and he passed away in the time of Ali radiallahu so look at what hope can do. Another thing that you should be reciting uh, around this Qaribul Maut or Muhtadar, somebody who is nearing death, is the Shahada. Talqeen. This is called Talqeen, where you're giving Laqqana Yulaqinu Talqeenan. This verb is basically referring to you, uh, you know, calmly and comfortably passing a beautiful message and repeating it to this individual who is not now dying away. And the reason why we do this is we reinforce our faith with, with Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah and coupled with that we remind the deceased or sorry the nearing the near death person what they what they lived for and what they're dying for Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin la sharika lah وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ That say, O Prophet of Allah, إِنَّ صَلَاتِي My worship, وَنُسُكِي my, bodily, my, uh, my devotion to Allah, my sacrifices, وَمَحْيَايَ My entire life, وَمَمَاتِي My death, لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I live and I die for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Acknowledge the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be God conscious of Him as He ought to be. And don't die except in a state that you're Muslims, subservient to Allah. So what are you enforcing or reinforcing at this moment? That you're leaving with this blessed deen from this tangible world into an untangible, untangible world, which is, your, which, your, which is your life hereafter and which you'll be raised for and which you'll live for now. You lived in this world, you're leaving this world now. But remember what you lived for and what you're leaving with. That is, shahadatu an la ilaha illallah 
wa Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this devotion. Okay? So constantly repeat the shahadatain, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, or Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah, around the person who is passing away. Now once again, I am highlighting that this is at occasions of natural death. Not unnatural deaths like accidents or drowning or something where you're not uh, there for. Okay? So embracing death. Part of embracing death is treatment of the deceased when death occurs. This is a very scary moment. I've experienced it with my grandfather. I've experienced it with, uh, you know, count, uh, countless, right? Uh, or a number of, uh, to say the least, uh, many people in the community here and other places where death occurs. This is like wildfire. You know, the family loses their senses and the women are in tears. At times they go into emotions and they start ripping their clothing. I've seen that as well. And hitting themselves. And the men, they are lost and quiet. You need to be that person who is the man of the moment or the woman of the moment. Keep your emotions at one place and keep your deen in front of you. Understand, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. So when the soul departs, try your best, my beloved brothers and sisters, to avoid wailing and shouting. This is antithetical to the message of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ in some narrations describes that this is a cause of the deceased person getting punished. At this juncture, I would like to invite you all to read a particular book. It's written by Mulana Ashik Ilahi Al Barni Al Bulan Shahri. It's called, you know, the uh, the concept of death or the reality of death. It's a thick book wherein he describes death from the beginning to the end through the hadith of the Prophet And in that book, he mentions multiple narrations about what the dead person still being able to hear things that are happening at the earliest moments of death and how that impacts the dead person. Yes, the only thing that they're unable to do is respond. So make sure that you are executing yourself, your mannerisms, your thought processes, turning into action adequately. So avoid wailing and shouting. If somebody, sorry, embrace qadr, understand that this is part of life. And I give the example that we're all here in transit. We came from the wombs of our mother prior to the alam al-arwah into this tangible world. We're all here in transit. Each and every one of us is waiting for our flights to the akhirah. Some of us, our tickets, you know, our ticket times are before others and others might depart later, but everyone has to leave. Everyone has to leave. So embrace qadr and understand this world to be Something that you're not going, that something that is not an everlasting place for you. As the Prophet ﷺ beautifully describes, you know, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says that once I was strolling around, you know, a young man, young chap, أَخَذَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ بِمَنْ كِبَيَّ The Prophet ﷺ grabbed the hold of my shoulders from the back, you know, to make that meeting, uh, you know, live. Get your attention, hey, Ibn Umar. And he said, yeah, he said, O oh, Ibn Umar, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw abiru sabil. That be in this world as if you are a stranger or a wayfarer, just passing by. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us the reality of this world. You know, a Muslim, subhanAllah, when it comes to death, they should have a happy component as well. What is that? I'm meeting my maker. I'm going to the life that is meant, you know, meant for me. From this life that was literally full of suffering, full of sadness at times, I'm going, inshallah, through the good that I did, bi'idhnillah, we all do good, towards the mercy of Allah, and an ending, unending life full of luxuries and goodnesses. The Prophet wasallam says, Ad-dunya maz'ra'atun lil This world is a cultivation for the hereafter. So not to go into so many details, but embrace qadr, embrace faith. And like I said, you need to be in that rational mindset. You see the uncles and aunties and the sons and daughters crying about, you know, wailing away, shouting. You be the 
you be the spare tire or you be the man of the moment or the woman of the moment, first thing you should do, the moment death occurs, close the eyes. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored human beings and you don't want, as men, uh, all of you know, the body to stiffen up after it dies to such an extent where the eyes don't close. And we've seen that as well, where people were in the mode of just banging their heads and crying away, not realizing that this is qadr, and they left. They forgot the, uh, subhanallah, the eyes of the deceased open. And it's such a scary sight at the occasion of the janazah, especially in Canada, where we have the viewing. You know, some masjids, they do the viewing. Some masjids, they prefer not to do the viewing. So they used, I think now they stopped, even in Canada. But it was very scary, you know. So close the eyes. I remember it was so emotional for me when my father, rahimahullah, passed away in front of me. And subhanallah, the death that he had, Allahu Akbar, he drank some, uh, I'm going off topic, just to mention examples of, if you live a good life, you live in a good manner. He drank some zamzam, rahimahullah, and Mulana Qasim is in the masjid. Uh, my uncles and them, they went for the first Jumu'ah. He says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And my father's soul departs by the second salam. Everyone around me is hysterical. You know, in hysteria, I mean. I go myself and I close the eyes and I do what, 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 what we have to do. Uh, you know, for the deceased. Bind the lower jaw with a bandage or tie a strip. I had my shawl, you know, the Saudi shawl that the Saudis wear. I used to wear that. So I took it off and I binded my father, rahimahullah's jaw so it doesn't stay open. Sometimes it naturally stays closed. Other times it remains open. And some people, once again, they made these mistakes and the mouth remains open, you know. So bind the jaw, tie a... <coughs> Tie a, a, a scarf or a shawl or, you know, a hijab or whatever it may be around the head of the person so that the mouth doesn't remain open with this pressure, you know, like this. And, or a cloth around the head. When a person dies, you know, Ibrahim, can you control it? When a person dies, the soul that is part and part and parcel of the body in each and every corner of the body, controlling it, it leaves, it escapes. And hence you have no control of the body, your feet go like this. You know, naturally, your feet will drop. After the eyes and binding of the face, make sure you go to the feet and you tie a strip around the feet. So if the body hardens, and it will harden, the feet are not like this and open. And it makes it difficult, not only as a sight, but even at the occasion of uh, the tajhiz and the takfin, you know, shrouding the deceased person. So tie, tie the feet. And then finally, what do you do? Place the arms on the sides with straightened fingers. These are four or five steps that you should 100% keep in mind. Regardless if you're emotional, if you're not emotional, keep this in mind. Okay. And alhamdulillah, Muslims, we are not for embalming or chemicalized substances to enter our bodies. So do this as naturally as possible. Some families then opt to get embalming done for, for example, the eyes that are left open. Why? Because they did not heed to what was important at the, at the adequate moment. So Muslims, you know, it is actually haram for us to embalm. Uh, and you know send off bodies etc I know some Muslims still do this and you know we have taken a very harsh stance against that that we need despite the sadness that occurs may, may be for your mother or your father or your son or your daughter that are that is back home you need to be buried where you die and I'll explain in the next slides. Now, of course, naturally, there will be some time before the tajhiz and the takfin takes place. I remember standing at one person's home for about five hours before they came, came to collect the body. And this is talking about villages. Yes, villages still do exist in North America. North America. 
Just because you're used to your city life, don't think that there, there aren't villages which suffer. Can you believe that? Five hours standing beside the Mayyit until somebody came to take them. So at that occasion, may it be five hours or five minutes or f whatever have you, make sure the privacy of the deceased person is observed. If anything occurred, for example, at the time of death, which was negative, don't say it to another person. For example, some people, they utter words of kufr at the occasion of death. Stay silent. Udhkuru mahasina mawtakum. Mention the good about your dead, dead person, not the bad. Or they, vom they vomited, or, you know, something very terrible happened. You can, uh, you can, uh, you know, comprehend the various odds. Stay silent about those private matters. You don't say it to anybody. Anybody who causes discomfort should leave that gathering, right? Humbly ask them or hold them, carry them away or usher them away because ultimately uh, this at times creates an environment of the same thing that that person is doing. That crying is addictive, you know? And uh, family should be given brief time with the deceased as well. If there's strangers around, right? If you've done your job, and if you're somebody who was just there to help, let the family be there. Muslims need to learn these mere ethics. May it be at the time of death or by the graveyard. At times, the, the, you know, subhanAllah, the own son of that father doesn't get to be by the graveside because of people rushing and causing commotion. When we need to have the utmost adab, even by the graveyard. So, yeah, before uh, being sent off for preparations, uh, give family their time. Have the funeral ASAP. The Prophet ﷺ mentions in bold references, he says emphatically that if it's a good person, then they've gone to where they're supposed to be, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's a bad person, then you've got, you got rid of a burden from your life. Bury them as fast as possible. You know. <clears throat> Almost yearly, I get fatawa, which I have to answer regarding embalming. Can I embalm my father and send him to Pakistan? You know? And I am very upfront with those people. I say this is haram in Islam. It is not something that is makruh. It is haram. Yeah? You can make dua for your father from Pakistan, although how, you know, how terrible that, that is emotionally. But you are making them suffer more by embalming them or delaying the janazah. Number one, you're delaying their destination which they are yearning towards if they're pious. And inshallah they are. Number two, as Mawlana Ashiq Ilahi Al-Barni mentions in that book, The Concepts of Death, the deceased person feels everything as well. And there's narrations to prove this from the Prophet ﷺ. And hence the Prophet ﷺ says that when you are carrying the janazah, make sure you don't shake to such an extent where it causes uneasiness to the uh, person who is in the janazah, who is on, you know, on the bed that you're carrying, because they feel every single thing. And he goes on to say, don't even break their bone. What, what is this referring to? Once again, you missed out that moment to prepare them adequately. Now you're fidgeting with things, breaking fingers, billah, you know, breaking eyelids. They feel that. The Prophet ﷺ is saying what? They feel that. The only thing is they can't respond to you, but they feel it. And hence, have the janazah ASAP. Believe it or not, my brothers and sisters, I tell you the sad situation of this ummah relates to this last point. This individual passed away. And the family came to me and, they're say, and they said, we're having a wedding over the weekend. Can we delay the janazah till Monday? I was overcome with emotions. And the only thing I could say is, are you kidding me? And what is wrong with you people? Have some shame for Allah's sake. Do you believe where we've be, what we've become, my brothers and sisters? 
We need to fear Allah in, in this regard. Brother Kareem says, I love repeating stories, but I'll repeat this story as well, where uh, at another occasion, you know, just to give you some grieving stories that we've uh, experienced in our life in dealing with janazas. The head of the janaza affairs in, Can in Toronto is Monana Shiraz, yeah? very humble man. Monana Shiraz, somebody came to him, and this is once again leading back to the tarbiyah of your children. A son came to him at the occasion of the death of that son's father. And he said to Mawlana Shiraz that, Look, Sheikh, I have a meeting at 12 p.m. I will give you the money for uh, the janazah, for the tajheez, the takfin. But regrettably, this is an important work meeting I can't miss. Please bury my father, etc. And, uh, you know, I'll give you the money for it. And Sheikh Siraj said this with tears in his eyes. And this is over 10 years ago, by the way. Situations are so bad now. And hence, we need to uh, you know, instill this concept of death and obedience in our children as well, my beloved brothers and sisters. Or, or, right? Tomorrow, for the one who's waiting for that tomorrow, is very near, as they say in the Arabic language. If you don't make adequate preparations, you and I will be waiting for, for the same, same concept. May Allah not test us. Funeral preparations, now washing the body. Okay, So number one basic uh, etiquette should be maintained. Naturally, males for females. Males should wa wash males. And females should wash females. Family members are preferred, but not a must. And that is why each person... in Every family, or at least one person in every family, should know about this, uh, you know, tajhiz uh, and takfin. It's fard kifaya. You know, fard kifaya means, in this context, that every home should have somebody who is knowledgeable of this. <clears throat> so you'll alleviate the bodies of impurities once you're in that room where you're washing the body. How do you do this? Inshallah, practically will demonstrate next in next month's session. But you'll take the palm of your hand and softly, gently rub the stomach. Rub, rub the stomach area. Um, and if by chance any impurity has come out from the private part, take cotton or tissue paper and gently rub that away. If you're able to wash it, wash it. But gently just rub it away because the body is already going to be washed and that water will be drained multiple times. Sometimes it's a very tough moment. You know, you're unable to maintain that person of yours who's sick. And hence the hair is not cut, the nails is not cut, the sideburns are, you know, still there, the mustache is long, the nails are uncut. Leave it that way, you know. The time is up for cleansing and purifying and remodeling. You came in this world naturally, you leave the way you pass away, naturally. Don't touch any hair from the body or any nails or any portion of the body that needed to be maintained and it wasn't maintained, finished. Time up, right? <clears throat> While you're washing, make sure that you cover the body appropriately so private areas are not exposed. Inshallah, once again I repeat, we'll show these by demonstration, uh, inshallah, next month. So from above the navel, below the knees, cover that area. And in order to wash the private parts, nowadays they have hoses. Some places they still use buckets. You lift up that towel slowly. And you know, with that glove of yours, hand of yours, you go between the crevices and wash the private parts. Even in this case, imagine, it is haram for you to look at the satr and the awra of the deceased person. This is the sanctity and the bashfulness of Islam. So you're not allowed to look at the awrah. Men for men, women for women. The awrah that is for the women at the time of life is the awrah for women at the time of death. And in that likely manner, the awrah that is for the places that need to be covered for men during your lifetime, that is the same awrah that needs to be covered at the time of death. You use uh, water with 
Kafur or camphor. Um, they call it camphor, I believe. If you don't have camphor available in these areas, you can use itr. There's no problem. Something that will give that water a good scent, a good flavor to it. So these are just examples of um, ghusl areas. You know, you see the individual uh, basically reenacting the steps that I described here. First, uh, pressing the stomach, washing from the top to the bottom, covering the private areas, tying the kafin up, and of course, these are all models. There's nothing to be scared about, inshallah, at this occasion. <clears throat> so in terms of the shrouding itself, the Muslim deceased should be shrouded with the kafan. Why? No tuxedo. Why not any dress to show the simplicity of this servant of Allah? That you came simple and you leave simple as well. That is why for the male, it is three cloths of kafan that will be utilized at the time of death. And for the female, it will be five kafan, five pieces of cloth to ensure more satr, more, because the, for the female, the entire body of theirs is awra, you know, for everyone else besides their face and hands, and according to some ulama, their feet. So you need to utilize, you know, five pieces as it will be demonstrated when we do the practical uh, tajhiz and takfin demonstration. And all of the kafin that Muslims use is chemically free. Now you won't believe me if I tell you that I attended a few burial workshops here in Peoria at the medical college. And subhanAllah, the way the non-Muslims were coming to me after the presentation and telling me that I, we wish we were buried like this because of how green the Muslim burial and earth-friendly the Muslim burial is. And I said, you know, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us that we kept to our ways and we keep to our ways and we don't accommodate the practices of the inhabitants of a particular area just because we've moved to that area. Like for example, the Christians in Syria, Palestine, they might bury the same way as Muslims. The Christians here, they won't do that. You know, they'll do all these embalming and then putting that tuxedo on and you know, by the end of it, their janazah cost, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And not only that, it's harmful to the earth once these chemical uh, full materials start rotting away in the earth. So subhanAllah, non-Muslims appreciated the way that I presented the green burial of Islam, how green and earth-friendly it, it is. So now this individual is uh, wrapped away, okay? So a male with three cloths, uh, and each cloth is bigger than the other. So the first cloth is smaller, the second cloth is a little bigger, the third cloth is to wrap the whole body away, and then <coughs> three different ties or five different ties. They say odd numbers uh, of ties, right? To just ensure that that kafan doesn't open up. <coughs> then that body is gently taken either to the masjid or in some context to the graveyard where there's a musalla. That's how they do it in South Africa, by the way. And this is the preferred method of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah make dua that we revive these sunan as the Muslims progress here and they grow as a community. We're able to facilitate these sunan of the Prophet alayhi salam. So we don't have to bring the bodies into the masjid anymore. And what is the hikmah behind that? Do you know the hikmah? Can anybody think of a possible hikmah of why we pray outside? Or technically why we should pray outside rather than in the masjid? Any guesses? Because sometimes the body, even after it's shrouded, it still leaks. And at times blood comes out, at times, you know, ajib things happen, weird things happen. And you don't want to pollute the masjid in that situation, or you don't want such an environment to take place, uh, or such a situation to take place in a closed environment. When it's in an open environment, somebody could quickly go and just, you know, throw the chair. Uh, chada, there's no cleaning of the carpet, you know, put a sheet over, whatever it may be, fix situations, and we're all good to go. So in terms of the funeral proceedings, the salah is something that 
is mandatory. And what is the philosophy behind the Salatul Janazah? When you are born, the Adhan is given in your ear. Does anybody pray two rakah salah? Shukr to Allah? No. That prayer is waiting for you for the time you die. That is why they say that enter the masjid horizontally before you're brought in vertically. Enter the masjid horizontally, like this, before you're brought in vertically. So pray before you're prayed on. So it's awla and more preferred that a family member, the next to the, the next of kin, as they say, prays upon the deceased person. So your son, for example, or your brother, or your uncle, whoever is available at that time, preferably the son. You pray upon the deceased person. Sometimes families are too emotional. They, re they request the imam to pray upon the deceased, and the imam should, you know, uh, basically uh, accommodate that request. And many imams, they don't ask the family as well. This is wrong. You, the imam needs to ask the family, is, does anybody among you want to lead the salah? Yes? Tayyib. Lead the salah. No? Okay, I will lead the salah. Because the, right, the, the first right goes to the family in terms of leading the prayer. And of course, the janazah salah is a means of forgiveness as an, and an intercession. It is a dua seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing for the mayyit. Now, we've left the masjid or we're at the graveyard and we're moving that body to where it's supposed to be buried. What ends up happening at this occasion? My brothers and sisters, please, Ensure that you're giving the family the first right to be near that hole that is dug up for their deceased. So close family and friends, they gather to bury the deceased around the grave, and this should serve as an ibrah. When will the time come where we actually take a lesson from death, my beloved brothers and sisters? And this is something that I ask myself as well. Why are we like goats and sheep in a corral that on the day of Eid, one of them is sacrificed? And the other goats and sheep, they run around for a few seconds and then everything is back to normal. Right? They don't care anymore. Why are we like these goats and sheep? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us dhu aqan, Allah has given us intellect. Allah has given us the ability to distinguish between you know, good and evil. Should not one single death be a life-changing moment? And I mentioned at this juncture the story of one sister who was combing her grandmother's hair. And she was not the most perfect of sisters, you know. While combing the hair, the grandmother passed away. And Allahu Akbar, it was such a life-changing moment for that sister that she became an exemplary figure in that entire community. Now, one single death, my beloved brothers and sisters, should be enough for you and I to make amends and change and make surah with Allah Taala. Rectify our connection with Allah and the people around us. As Muslims, we bury without a casket wherever it's you know, legally able to do so. Many a times, legally, you're not able to do so. Like in Toronto, we still haven't figured ourselves out. So what, we, what do we do as Muslims? We get such a wooden box that disintegrates and decomposes on contact with dirt. We still have to get it. So by the next day, it's all dirt anyways. But we've missed out on fulfilling the sunnah of the Prophet So ensure that the body is buried without a casket. This not only fulfills the sunnah, but it's helpful to this earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us as an aman. Number three, family members, and Brother Majid has seen this. You know, One time I, I was beside him, I'm like, what, the, what are these people doing? Family members, family members teach them to go into the grave and try as much as possible to face the deceased towards the Kaaba. It's not an, a, you know, it's not a ceremony for every single person to give their opinion there. You know, Subhanallah. Many a times the commotion that we create at the graveyard it is so bad. You know, it is against the adab of the graveyard and that deceased person. The brother is screaming from afar. No, no, the, the head is not still facing the qibla. Oh, you need to put a you know, rock by the bottom. What is that? Let the family go, try their best to do what the imam or what the shaykh taught them to do, and leave it to that. 
You know, even if it's not as perfect as you want it, because you might not know what is perfect. Commotion is not supposed to be caused. We need to do it in an adequate manner where that silence is maintained, that tadabbur is happening, that contemplation upon death that just visited this person who we're putting into the graveyard. So let the family members, the close kith and kin, descend into the grave, ensuring that the body or the face of that body faces the qibla or the ka'ah. Now, after the deceased is buried, in some occasions, uh, a prayer is rendered, right? Dua is rendered. Rendered. Uh, some people prefer to read the Quran. You know, there is a basis for all of these practices, and none of nobody should be condemned for any of these practices. It's very diverse. And many times because uh, we don't know exactly where other people are coming from or we haven't read those narrations, we begin to condemn them. Let people be as they are. And if people need education, not at the graveyard, afterwards. The imam could do it at the masjid. We need to maintain that respect until we all leave the graveyard. And of course, nothing must be built on the grave. And this is not in reference to the uh, name stone right, or the tombstone, rather on the grave. Many a times... It's like a ice arena that people build onto the grave, like crystal, uh, sorry, not crystal, like clear, uh, shining marble that they put like a slab over the grave. That should not happen as well. The Prophet ﷺ forbade this for fear of people making these tombs into worship homes one day or another. In terms of the burial, there are two, uh, sorry, the graveyard, there are two types of qabr or graves in Islam. One is the shiq and one is the lahad. The shiq is the usual type of graveyard that we are accustomed to uh, utilizing to bury in a North American context because the earth here is more firm. When you go to places like India or Africa or the Arab countries or you know uh, South Africa, uh, then they have the lahad. What is the difference between the shiq and the lahad? The difference between the shiq and the lahad is that the shiq is basically straight down with a small canopy below that or just straight down, right? Straight um, nine foot or ten foot, whatever it may be, downwards. And the lahad, what they do is because the earth is so moist and it might collapse over each other, so they dig a ground and then on the side they dig a <coughs> nether section. And the deceased person is put into that section and some bamboo wood or some other strong material is placed at the mouth of that extra section that you built to ensure that that ground doesn't collapse. But still in many cases back in various countries, it still does collapse. And the family every year, they need to go and put dirt on top. So this is the difference. Both are Islamic. The Prophet ﷺ was buried with a lahad. Why? Because the earth of that time was made as such, or the earth in that, sorry, context is made as such. We can't do that because uh, we would cause bad collapse to occur with the firm land, or we would just be just, or, or we would just end up wasting space, okay? All right, finally, <clears throat> Islam advises that mourning upon the deceased should not last for more than three days. You can be sad more than that, but you can't mourn more than that. Three days move on. Three days is in the fitrah of Bani Adam, human beings to change things. Go from one situation to another. You can possibly be sad until you die because you can't you know, work with, you, know, you can't accept it that, oh, this happened, right? I mean, you have to accept it as qadr, but you can't accept it emotionally. But mourning, meaning being unfunctional from everything else should stop after three days. A person should move on and focus upon the lessons that they learned from that life, uh, the life of that deceased person, the legacy of that person. And for a wife whose husband passes away, Islam encourages that they, uh, they engage in a mourning period for four months and ten days. And you might ask why? This is to ensure that there is possibly no pregnancy. You know, sometimes the pregnancy doesn't show up the first month, the second month, the third month. And some occasions, some women have gotten married and they realize that they were pregnant from their first husband. So there's this mourning period for their, this woman, the Muslim woman 
that amounts to four months and ten days, and this is by the nafs of the Qur'an. Okay? And Islam emphasizes that the goal of this world should be the success of the hereafter, not lamenting upon the losses of this world. مَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدُ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقْ What is with you will finish, and what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ever remain. And, and hence, you know, rejoice upon, alhamdulillah, the good that this person did, which will ever remain. With Allah, you know, for that person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also upon yourself, just as you will fade away, but inshallah, the good that you did in this world will ever remain. So that should be something that makes a Muslim happy. <clears throat> it is sunnah to feed the family of the deceased and take care of them. And the Prophet did this at many occasions. Among them was the occasion where Ja'far was brutally martyred. Uh, you know, uh, the occasion of, uh, at the occasion of Mu'tah, at the occasion of Mu'tah, right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Sahaba عنهم, to feed his family for about three days or more. Once again, speak only good about the deceased. I have a practice that I like to revive as the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that once we are gathered for uh, condolences, each and every person of the family. So once a very popular person in Canada passed away and the family is literally hundreds of people. So they were all surrounded in their huge home, mashallah. And I asked each and every one of them, mention something good about your uh, dead person, your deceased. And they all did and they came to terms with this qadr of Allah. It helps you heal. You know, when you, when you mention the good about the person who's left you, so this is the sunnah of the Prophet as well. And then finally, when you see death occurring, the number one life-changing moment at that occasion that should occur is you becoming a better person by focusing upon your parting of the world. That if I part from this world right now, at this moment, while I'm speaking to you, will my Allah be happy with me? And have I done a service to humanity that is of some sort of a benefit or not? These are questions that a person should on a daily basis ask themselves. Otherwise, we become ahjar, you know, we become rocks, solid, you know, thinking that alhamdulillah we have it all and we're never going to leave this tangible temporary world ever. <coughs> Every day question yourself about if you're prepared for death. And that will bring about balance in your life. And do it without OCD. Do it as a natural process. And, re and you know, as I mentioned, uh, inshallah, as I've mentioned, that it, it is part and parcel of a believer's life to understand that one day we are going to meet Allah. And this gives the believer some sort of a happiness. How do we know this? Because the moment we visit the graveyard, what is the dua that we recite? Assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyari min al-mu'mineen wa al-muslimin wa inna insha'allahu bikum lahiqun What in our dua or in our salams, what do we say? That salam, we, we say salams first and then we say insha'allah we're going to meet you soon. Which other faith teaches you that you're going to meet the deceased soon? That is how much hope a believer should have in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this insha'allah we will conclude and if it's okay, I will delay Salatul Isha by three, four minutes because we will do a practical demonstration of the Salatul Janazah. So I want everybody to stand up, inshallah. And we will go through the Salatul Janazah very quickly. Uh, and after this program, I will send you this presentation along with the du'as that we recite in Salatul Janazah. Okay, so in order uh, to recite, I'll face the camera. <coughs> There's no ruku or sujood in Salatul Janazah. Just, just leave it like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll be looking at the There's no ruku or sujood, bowing or prostration in the Salatul Janaza. It is only a single standing with a matter of a few takbirat. Okay? So the niyyah that you should have in the heart is that salah is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never pray salah for anybody else. No sujood, no ruku is done for anybody else. No standing is for, done for anybody else. It is done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the dua that is in the salah is for the mayyit, for the person that's passed away. This is the niyyah that should, we should have. So I'm facing qibla. In your heart you say this. 
uh, I'm praying these Salatul Janaza. The Salah is for Allah, and the Dua which consists in the Salah is for the Mayyit. And then, the, in the Hanafi Madhab, you only raise your hands for the first Takbirat, while the other Madhahib say, you raise your hands for all the other Takbirat. So basically, you've made the Niyyah, then you'll say Allahu Akbar. So repeat after me, Allahu Akbar. You'll tie your hands, and then either you'll read Surah Al-Fatiha or the Fana. So you can read either or. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, the entire Surah Al-Fatiha. Or you can read the, the Thana, which is, repeat after me, Subhanaka Allahumma, wa bihamdika, wa tabarak asmuka, wa ta'ala jadduka. And some ulama say, you could add, wa jalla thanauka, wa la ilaha ghayruk. Or you can just say, wa la ilaha ghayruk. And then you'll do the next takbirat, according to Al-Aimmat Al-Thalafa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmed, you'll raise your hands, right? According to Imam Abu Hanifa, you keep the hands tied and you say Allahu Akbar. So you can do either or per, uh, based on your madhab. So you'll say Allahu Akbar. This is the second takbirat, which you will recite after this, the salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, salawat Ibrahimiyyah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid Thereafter you will follow to do the third takbirah Allahu Akbar you can either raise your hands or keep them tied Allahu Akbar and after this you will read any dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught you in reference to the janazah or the dua of janazah. So the common dua that we recite, which I'll send to you once again, Allahumma ghfir li hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina. If you know it, repeat after me. Wa ghaibina wa kabirina wa saghirina wa dhakarina wa unthana. Allahumma man ahyaytahu minna fa ahyihi ala islam. Wa man tawafaytahu minna fa tawafahu ala al-iman. And thereafter, you will say a fourth takbirah, Allahu Akbar. Once again, the Hanafis won't raise their hands. Al-A'immat al-Thalatha, they raise their hands. And you can make a brief dua for yourself and your families, or you keep silent. And thereafter, the Imam will say, As-Salamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Some ulama say it's only one salam. Others, they say it's two salams. Whatever the Imam does, you follow them. And if you're the Imam, Make sure you've learned the Salat al Janaza adequately based on the teaching that you're familiar with. Uh, Sister Louise asked a question, and inshallah, after this, I'll ask Sheikh Imad to lead the Salah because I still need to make wudu. Uh, I don't want to delay you any further. Uh, quickly give the Adhan, Brother Karim, and start the Salah. Uh, Sister Louise uh, asked the question that why do we stand by the head for the man and by the sadr, the chest for the woman? So there's, this is because of the practice of the Prophet Wasallam. At one occasion, a male janazah was brought and the Prophet Wasallam stood by the head. And at that same occasion or at another occasion, a female janazah was brought and the Prophet Wasallam stood by the sadr, the chest. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and his madhab says, no, this was a very particular context. Uh, this was because the woman was not properly covered. They didn't have adequate garment to cover. So the Prophet ﷺ stood in the middle to ensure a greater covering. Uh, so the Imam Hanifa and his madhab, they stand by the head for males and females. So at the end of the day, it's uh, ultimately a fiqh preference. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us whatever lessons that we learned from this uh, presentation to give us those as a benefit to us and not as a harm. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to bless this gathering of ours. And inshallah, like I mentioned, the next gathering will demonstrate how to wash the body and shroud it, bi'ithnillah. So hopefully be there for that. With this wa akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Brother Kareem, give the adhan, Shaykh. Imad, lead the salah.